Thank you, Pedro, and thank you all of the panelists. Uh, we'd like to open it up for, for, for questions. Um, as Dr. Shushliki said, you know, we want to make the questions very, very brief. And let me use a uh, moderator's prerogative and, and have the first question here if I can. Uh, two things have become apparent in this conference. That One is that Khrushchev misled, and I'm using a very polite term, I think, Kennedy with regards to the tactical nuclear weapons that were not revealed. And second, uh, Brian pointed out that Fidel was gaining influence over the Soviet forces, and the Soviet forces were close to going native, and Pedro has emphasized his, his charismatic. Can we speculate a little bit now about what would have happened had the Soviets decided to leave those weapons in Cuba, perhaps thinking that they're under our control with a truly understanding that Fidel could have been gaining uh, influence over those forces. Let me, let me mention this, which answers your, precisely your question. There is an interview on the Daily Workers. This is a socialist, communist paper, British Marxist, and written by Sam Russell. That interview Che Guevara. And Guevara says to him that if the missile has been under the Cuban control rather than the Russians, they will have been fired. So, Jose, I don't have any doubt. Brian, would you like to add? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to read, Joe, in response to your, your question from a, uh, a document, uh, an article that actually was written by Svetlana, who was here earlier. It's in Foreign Affairs. Um, Castro wanted to keep the tactical nukes, and he wanted to make it known to the world, especially, of course, to the United States. Uh, in, in, the, in her article, she says, the final straw for Mikoyan came on November 20th when Castro sent instructions to Cuba's representative at the United Nations, Carlos Lechuga, mm -hmm. to mention publicly, quote, we have tactical nuclear weapons which we should keep. And that was, you know, that was intended to be partly for negotiating, negotiating advantage. But I think the answer to your question is that had they, uh, had, had they somehow been left behind in Cuban hands, it, uh, the Cubans would have, Fidel would have made it known immediately. It would have been public. And it would have acted as a, exactly the kind of strategic deterrent that, uh, against the United States that he always wanted to get from the Soviets. You know, it's, it's interesting that uh, through all of these years, beginning there in November, October, November 1962, Fidel has always wanted more than anything, some kind of guarantee, strategic guarantee from the Soviets that they would, uh, they would fight for Cuba against the U.S. if Cuba were invaded. He never got it. His behavior on Black Saturday uh, was, was, was so bizarre, was so extreme, that every Soviet leader, beginning with Khrushchev and all the way through Gorbachev, uh, they, all, they all felt, they all believed there was no way they could give that strategic guarantee to Fidel because he was just too unpredictable, too unreliable as an ally. Okay. Al? Yes. I guess a question to Mr. Latell and also Mr. Hidalgo is just the same question. Uh, given that there was some verification that the strategic <coughs> missiles were withdrawn, but there was no verification, independent or otherwise, that the tactical nuclear warheads were withdrawn. Do you have any feeling yourselves, given your intelligence, background in the intelligence community and you with the Cuban government, whether they were actually withdrawn, the, the tactical warheads? Yes. Yes, I'm very confident that they were, Al. I, I based, guess. based on experience and based on you know what I know of what I know of this entire situation, yes, I, I, I think there's, there's really no reason to think that any were left behind. Uh, I agree absolutely with Mr. Latoya, yes. Do you? I have uh, two quick questions for Brian and uh, a very short comment for Pedro. Uh, uh, Brian, uh, in, when you questioned uh, Mr. Dobbs before as to whether Castro believed uh, the uh, the uh, overwhelming superiority that the uh, U.S. had over uh, the Soviet Union, especially strategic weaponry. Uh, 
Uh, you seem to indicate that that you don't think so. In other words, that, that you that you thought that he was very well aware of that disparity. However, both in the Mikoyan meeting, November the 22nd, which is described by uh, uh, Ms. Zaraskaya, uh, but also way before, 15 years ago, by uh, Naftali and Fresen. They have a, a very thorough description of the meeting. And in the meeting in Cuba in May, uh, of 1962, before the, uh, the business were sent, what he agreed to. He indicated at both times, he seems to anyway, that he definitely believed that the Soviet Union was extremely strong, uh, strong enough to, to challenge the, uh, the U.S. So, you know, that. I want you to make that clear. And the second question is, this is something that has never been very particularly covered by anyone, and nor has very importance given to it. Uh, but, but it's one of the main points of my uh, doctoral dissertation. Uh, the presence of the <coughs> Soviet troops in Cuba in the, in the, uh, during the build-up for the, for the uh, introduction of the missiles had a very uh, different uh, result that has been ignored. It allowed the Cuban government to put 30,000 troops in the Cambrai and clean up all the opposition in Cuba forever and ever. Because it's, the uh, Soviet troops were there and they were, they, you know, they were keeping the order, so he, had, he was able to. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, what do you think of that? And to Pedro, uh, this is a personal anecdote I have cited it many times, and it's not well known at all. Uh, this was uh, said during a lecture by Foy Kohler, who was briefly a visiting professor here in 1965, and I was in his class. Kohler said to the class that when, when Khrushchev uh, wrote the first letter, and it was delivered to the embassy at 3 in the morning in Moscow, it was, it, according to him, Khrushchev was completely terrified and most probably drunk because of the composition of the letter, strike hours with the vehicle. So, you know, that goes to what you said. Uh, and finally, on the, uh, on the meeting between the Reading and, uh, and Robert Kennedy, actually, that had been decided hours before. That was just for, basically for show. Sure. And the U.S. Did. I just want to make a comment on this issue, which is who won the missile crisis. And I want to quote my dear Professor Jaime Suchiliki in his book. He says that it is ironic that the crisis hailed as a U.S. victory was nothing more than an ephemeral victory. It returns in return for the removal of offensive weapons from the island, the United States was satisfied to accept a communist regime only a few miles from its shores. <coughs> Kennedy would be assassinated a year later and Khrushchev sacked as prime minister within two years. And Fidel is still there. Dying a long, long process of dying, but still there. And Bobby Kennedy, yes. I, uh, oh. Diego had several questions. No, no, the question is whether you believe. I, I, yeah, I, I, I think that your point about the Escambray is a good one, Diego. That uh, that the presence of Soviet troops there, but they were they were a they were a garrisoned force. They were they were not really providing too much by way of defense, but. Another point is that uh, the meeting that Fidel had with Mikoyan on the 22nd of November, and I recommend this document that I read from a moment ago. This is from Svetlana's book. Uh, and um, Fidel is obsessed in this meeting with Mikoyan. This is when he learns that the tactical nukes are going to be taken away. And Mikoyan makes up the pretext that there's a law and that they have to be taken away. But he gets a consolation prize. And the consolation prize is Matt, he can keep all of the conventional weapons, 
that the Soviets had delivered. Everything else he can keep, not the strategic weapons, the IL-28s or the, any of the nuclear weapons. But he can keep everything else. And from that day forward until the end of the Soviet Union and their, their alliance, every, every item in the Cuban military, almost every item in the Cuban military arsenal was provided free of charge by Moscow at the cost of about a billion dollars a year by the old CIA estimates that I remember. So Cuba became, Cuba became militarily very, very strong as the Soviet Union provided all of this free conventional uh, armament. It was enough for the Cubans to use in Angola, in Ethiopia, in Nicaragua, and all around the world, and to, to develop, as someone said, one of the, one of the largest, uh, most effective militaries anywhere in the third world. So that was Fidel's consolation prize, no tactical nukes. And of course, all of that did help Fidel when he was putting down the, the insurgencies, uh, the opposition, and the Escambrai. You asked me about Gilpatrick, I think. No, I asked you whether you actually believe that Castro was aware of this. Of the, oh, yeah. I, the I, I, situation I, 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 you know, I have that much respect for Fidel. As an intellectual, as a, as someone uh, who someone who engages in devil's advocacy, I, I I guess I disagree with Michael. I think Fidel, when he heard of, when he read about the Gilpatrick speech in October '61, <coughs> Fidel would have would have consulted with his uh, intelligence and military and said, "Who's right? Are they, am I are the Soviets really that bad off?" And I think with the intelligence they had, they would have uh, he would have known. Now, how do you explain it? How do, why why did he lie? Why has he lied so many times about that? Maybe it's because he knew, in, as early as May 1962, when Raoul consulted with the Soviets, maybe he knew as early as that time that the tactical nuclear weapons were part of the package. And if he was going to get tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba, uh, then he could, he could say anything. We, we have time for just a couple of more, more questions, Maria, and I'm going to come here. Mine is more a comment, but it could be a question. <clears throat> Um, psychopathy is a very well-defined uh, personality disorder, and I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but if you read the definition, Fidel has all the symptoms of psychopathy, yes. and it explains a lot of things that have been discussed here today. My question is, um, has anybody consulted with a psychiatrist that knows the history of this man? And, 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 a, and, a, and a comment about that is, um, if we extrapolate what happened in the missile crisis, some of us believe that Cuba probably developed a uh, bio-warfare program by the 1990s that, that I think Cuba dismantled after um, September 11th, but that's just a theory. And uh, I don't think there is a smoking gun. But the U.S. government actually made comments um, in, in the early 2000s about that. We're very, I mean, I think we're much better off that Fidel is near death and never used that, um, given the psychology well, of this. Movie. You know, Maria, you know well in my first book, After Fidel, I do describe Fidel as a sociopath. And I, I do it fleetingly. And I don't try to develop it in detail because I'm not a psychiatrist either. But I, my understanding is that socio a sociopath and a psychopath, nowadays the terms are almost interchangeable. I don't think it means necessarily, though, if you, if you describe someone as, someone as psychopathic or sociopathic, I don't think it necessarily follows that that person loses touch with reality. No. So I don't, I wouldn't argue that Fidel has ever, I don't, my study of Fidel, Leads, has always led me to conclude, at least until recently, until now that he's decrepit, that he doesn't lose touch with reality. He, uh, he has not been a psychopath in that sense. But there's a psychiatrist right here behind you who's, who's an expert on this. Please. And I've, I've consulted with Maximo Monterrey. Maximo Monterrey is a psychiatrist. I participate somehow in the crisis, and I have my doubts about the I don't think he's mentally sick. I don't think he's a schizophrenic paranoid. My diagnosis is a famous diagnosis of many big men in history that is called pure paranoia syndrome. This pure paranoia syndrome consists in five main symptoms. Paranoid ideas, grandiose ideas, <laughs> 
not breaking with reality, grandiose ideas, uh, realistic ideas about persecution, high, high IQ, and latent homosexuality. Five later, not homosexual. Later, <laughs> later is something else. Later, homosexuality is a very interesting syndrome, which is that that will really take us outside of the. Mission is out. I was trying to keep this into the mission crisis. <laughs> okay, that is that you like men, you like the comfort of men. You enjoy them, but it's very threatening to do anything genital. That's latent homosexuality it happened to many people in bars. People go to drink in bars to share with other men, and they come home and accuse his wife of being with him. That's latent homosexuality, which without, I think, has that fifth symptom. And that's my diagnosis of his problems. Besides that, I want to say thank you very much for inviting me here. And I want to say also that in that switch back and forth with Khrushchev and Fidel, there was two telegrams. One telegram of Nikita to Fidel, and I'm going to say in Spanish, is Fidel, soquete, the well-driven of poetas. <laughs> And he answered back a telegram to him saying, Nikita, Mariquita, lo que se da no se quita. <laughs> well, we have time for a couple of more questions, man. Uh, I, I want to apologize to use uh, some of your minutes, uh, but I want to stimulate uh, other areas of uh, research. Uh, Cuba has uh, two ambassadors during the crisis in the United Nations. The first one was Mario Barcin Chauti and the second one was uh, Carlos Lechuga. In the case of Mario Garcin Chauté, uh, he uh, proposed in the Security Council that if in Cuba work missiles, he would keep, sería renunciar de su posición, of uh, his position in the Security Council. Uh, it was coincident with Sorin, with uh, Valerian Sorin, the ambassador of the Soviet <coughs> Union, and uh, one day after, uh, as you know, Adlai Stevenson present the whole photos of the uh, missiles in Cuba, and that was the reason because he left the Security Council and returned to Cuba in a deeply personal crisis. I was working for him with him for many years, and also with Carlos Lechuga, and I know that he didn't receive any instructions of the Cuban government about the existence of missiles in Cuba. In the case of Lechuga, his mission force was addressed to incorporate UTAN, the Secretary General, to Cuba, to the position of Cuba, bring UTAN to Cuba, and ask UTAN to press for the presence of Cubans in the negotiation was, was uh, negative on the side of the U.S. and the Soviets, uh, on the so and the Soviets uh, officials. And the other point I would like to mention is that on October 22, 1962, the Soviets arrest Oleg Vladimirovich Jankowski that Brian, my dear friend, mentioned in his comments, and nobody Nobody mentioned uh, and appreciate the information Penkovsky gave in more than 2,000 hours of intelligence work with the U.S. and the British. And I think that this is two fields that are open for future research. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question, time for one or two. We're Brian, going. your reports are excellent. Really, really excellent. And Jaime, you're a legend. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. I'm saying this is something I've never been able to figure out. Here's Castro, one of the worst dictators we've ever seen. You had a Hitler, you had a Stalin, you had a Mussolini. None of these guys were ever called by their first name. And here's the enemies of Castro, Boca Fidel, Boca Fidel. 
I think there's a love-hate relationship here, guys, and I really have a hard time. Don't get me zapatos, I mean, it's all one of the worst cases. I don't know why it's for you. Well, Whenever everybody like Stalin, like, like, Hitler, you're not called a little bit. 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 You're not called a little bit.
uh, fight for their freedoms. With the years, and as the U.S. Be became embroiled in Vietnam, now that's an opinion, the whole thing began to change. <coughs> and Castro, the focus on Castro was turned into Vietnam like a horse that you put these things on the side and only look to the front, and then it went to Vietnam, and Vietnam was, and then Vietnam developed into an ugly affair, and the whole scene began to change. And then war in the U.S. became a bad war. I mean, uh, you could not think about going to war. And so it is a process, a long process, that we were cut. In, then the Soviet Union collapsed, Fidel remained, but then Cuba was not part of the Cold War because the Cold War ended with the fall of the Soviet, or with the, with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there are, this is a long process, very complicated, and I don't know if I, I have been able to synthesize the answer because it's a very confused period. Well, time for, for one more question, but just very, very quickly. Uh, Nations are going to decide what they want to decide in terms of their own security and make whatever decisions they choose to do. Outside of the context of the Cold War, Cuba is an insignificant Caribbean island. And, and, and you know, if you take the Cold War out, there's not much there for, for One last question, sir. Thank you very much. I heard Mr. Hidalgo mention that there was a process of negotiations several times to different <coughs> crises or differences that could show between Soviets and the Cubans. And I, when I see the time frame in which the decision was made and the missiles were shipped <coughs> out to the troops, I see a very short time. My question is this. Since Raul was the guy that gave the final word and authorization, the visit was made in June, and I heard that the troops are moving in July to Cuba. Is there a written agreement that he signed under what conditions his troops will be there, which orders will they obey, or how the command structure will be, or how many installations will be open for his, or whatever? I guess roads have to be built, built, sometimes bridges have to be reinforced to allow the trucks. So my question is, is there an agreement signed between Raul Castro and the Soviet Union that we can see what exactly at least one side had in mind and what the others agreed to. I don't know, to be honest with you. Well, I have no clear idea about that. I focus my uh, intervention in what happened after that. It's hard for me to imagine that all these well, it's common knowledge. It's common knowledge that Raúl is the one who went to to Moscow first to to discuss the problem. But uh, as far as an agreement, a written agreement, I have no idea. I can assure that. At least, at least um, until now, they haven't found it. I th I think we're ready for lunch, and if we we'll just go over there, we have the lunch being served right now. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God, that was